So many new LLM AI chat models. We're gonna talk about Meta's iJepa, Microsoft's Orca model, the open source Starcoder model, and Google's unbelievable progress on Pathways multimodal sparse model. But we all have to acknowledge the big dog, the talk of the town, Anthropics Claude 2 is out now. And don't even worry if all those words were just like a jumble of blah, blah, blah. By the end, it's gonna make sense. We're just talking all things chatbot. Anthropic is a well-funded company that is full of ex-OpenAI employees. Now, a lot of people consider Anthropic one of the few companies that might be able to really compete with OpenAI. And what sets this model apart, Claude 2, it has what's called a 100K context window, meaning you can paste into the input field way more text than GPT can handle. So it can handle 13 times the amount of input, so not just like a long blog like ChatGPT could handle, like an entire book or a 50-page research paper, or as I'm gonna demonstrate, a whole bunch of Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris debate. So first off, what is this new large language model? Claude 2. So Claude 2 is a newly unveiled AI model. So it boasts an improved performance, longer responses, basically ChatGPT, but with an extended memory and less harmful output, they say. So the goal of this model is to be more well aligned for the future of AGI. This could be humanity's hope at having a more trustworthy system in the long run. But it's about as good as the top of the line right now in mathematics, coding, and reasoning. Just got some great scores on the bar and the GRE reading exams. But let's put it to the test. How much Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris can it handle? So before you is four long form debates between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson. It's obviously a lot of big words. It's a ton to take in. These are two great philosophers just like going at it like in a super intense way. Each video is about two hours. That is a lot of text, but we're gonna see if Claude 100K can handle it all or where it tops out at. This is the part one transcript. Peterson presents his concept of God as a metaphorical way to represent things like consciousness. Okay, can handle 21,000 words like a champ, but we're not done. Let's add another debate. That brings our input to about 45,000 words, but 100K context window, which is a token, which could be like a word or a word phrase, might be a little bit similar to 100,000, so I think we can even put in another. Debate number three puts us at about 65,000 words, but adding in debate number four brings us to 83,614 words. Can Claude two handle? Let's find out. Summarize this transcript. All right, I hope my computer has enough RAM to handle this cut and paste. All right, it's all in there. Enter. And there you have it, eight hours of Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris debating, like, that's an eight hour, that's a full day. The discussion centered around topics like the role of religion, the relationship between facts and values, the limits of rationality. Overall, the dialogue centered on reconciling respect for reason and science and human progress with receiving guidance from the past, finding common and ethical ground, and acknowledging irreconcilable metaphysical differences between belief systems. And there you go, man. Claude 2 just saved me eight hours. Although I still kind of want to watch the whole thing, but you, you get the point. OpenAI released a project called Super Alignment. Now in this article they released, they talk about the uncertainty that comes around with an artificial intelligence system becoming super intelligent and why it's really hard to control something that's so much smarter than all of humanity. In fact, they call it a formidable challenge, but I would call it a lot harder than that. Anyways, they point out the truth. Current alignment techniques, not up to snuff. And their idea to start tackling this problem is to start creating a superhuman AI model, one that's quote, a human level automated alignment researcher, unquote. Yeah, so basically a new AI, a chat bot that's way smarter than humans that can help us control the way smarter than human out of control super intelligence. And sadly, this is the best idea that I have ever heard. I'm 100% behind it. It still seems like crazy that we have to build another AI to control the first AI and just hope that that one doesn't go rogue. But this model is going to be a one trick pony. Its goal is to keep humanity safe. And when they're confident that's what it does, they're gonna put insane computational power, just like pump all the data and like GPU at it and just say like, get bigger and bigger and bigger. Cause if it's bigger and it's the good guy, That'll be better for us. So in the post, they say to keep humanity safe, they're going to quote, use vast amounts of computational power to align super intelligence. So this AI system will become an expert at evaluating other AI systems. And second, testing misaligned models. And third is as it learns more about the problem of alignment and it reports that back to researchers, it, they will give it the new abilities that it needs to do a better job at what it needs to do, which might lead to completely new areas of research that we haven't even thought of yet. So a good news is at least the best researchers in the world are like down with this project because 
we need people like Ilya Seskover, who is the lead on this project, to be doing this kind of a thing. Also, OpenAI has even dedicated a full 20% of their computational power over the next four years to this project alone. Now, why it isn't 51%, I'm kind of curious about, but hey, 20% is enough to like get it off the ground. And I'm sure if we see an existential threat, they'll be like, ah, let's give it 100%, you know? Meet iJepa. This is Meta AI's first supermodel. I mean, the first one that's based on their theory of autonomous intelligence, as explained by Jesus Rodriguez on this post. He talks about how iJepa can basically fill in the missing parts of a picture in the same way a human would. That is not by looking at every single pixel, but thinking about it in a more abstract, more human-like way. This model's trained on higher level object thinking, so when it sees part of an object, it kind of knows what the object looks like, not just the pixel patterns that would usually be there. The system uses a method called vision transformers to understand the visible parts of the image and predict what the missing parts might look like. And I would say just get acquainted with the word vision transformers, because I got a feeling we're going to be hearing a lot more of it. But more than that, iJepa also uses something called positional tokens, which helps the system understand where in the image the hidden parts are located. So it's crazy because on a higher level, the model's actually making a quick sketch of what the rest of the object would probably look like. And it does an amazing job, the best in the world, at thinking about how an object might be positioned and rotated inside of an image. Smash that subscribe button. Now, I heard some rumors through the grapevine I want to share with you, but keep it to yourself. Psst, over here, come here. Did you know that Alberto Romero actually exposed the GPT-4 secret? So it turns out that from the rumor mill, GPT-4 might actually be eight smaller models all working together. Hmm. So Alberto Romero talks in his article about how he thinks that each of the eight pieces of the model might be trained on 220 billion parameters. So that does as a whole put it way above that one trillion parameter mark that a lot of people were speculating on. In fact, what's the math on that? Yeah, that would be 1.7 trillion. Actually, let's round it up, 1.8 trillion. That's a lot of parameters. This revolution, yet to be officially confirmed, would raise questions about the state of the art in AI. Prominent industry figures such as George Holtz, the founder of Kama.ai, Somuth Chintala, and the co-founder of PyTorch at Meta have all lent some credibility to these rumors. But you didn't hear it from me, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little nerdy to you, but this is about how we can maybe optimize hyperparameters. So I'll explain what those are, why they're important, and then how we can maybe optimize them. So you've heard about the transformer model. You know that it's behind GPT and it's kind of revolutionizing the large language field, but there's a technical challenge, which is all about tuning what's called hyperparameters that is still kind of a fuzzy science. Hyperparameters are a predetermined factor. And when those predefined values are off, you totally screw up all the effort you're gonna put in later in the process. And because the transformers are so sensitive to these little dials that you have to get right in the first place, and there's all these different strategies right now competing to figure out the best way to optimize them. And a lot of the competing strategies are explained in depth in Hubar Ray's article titled, Hyperparameter, this is the basic problem of transformer. And they all have pros and cons, but in a nutshell, grid search is a way where you define a grid of these hyperparameters, and then you train small models for each combination that's possible to figure out what the optimal one might be before you scale up. Now there's also the random search approach, which allows you to cast a wider net, do more random sampling, and sometimes end up with an unexpected optima. It's also Bayesian optimization, which is the probabilistic model. And of course, probably the most notable, reinforcement learning. Just a machine learning approach that maximizes a reward signal. Now I want to jump back to Google because all this like DeepMind, Google Brain, like Gemini stuff is obviously like about to take off and they're doing some amazing things. I cannot wait to see how powerful it is. But they released a paper about what's called their pathway architecture and this is like kind of even bigger than a single model. So let's talk about it. Smash that subscribe button. So Devanish wrote an article on Medium called Understanding Google's GPT Killer, which emphasizes the significant advancements brought forward by the pathways architecture. That is where the same model is trained on multiple tasks at the same time, which is much closer to how human beings learn. We are learning language at the same time we're learning about gravity and objects and food and all the things in our environment. Same brain is just sort of activating different parts, but not really different parts. They're all working together at the same time. They're just some parts of it getting like more tuned, but the rest of it's still learning along with it. Now the pathways architecture also implements something called a sparse activation. And that allows only one portion of the entire neural network to be activated for a given task, which is really interesting to me because that means that actually adding more neurons to the brain, the hyperparameters that we talked about earlier in this video, aren't such a big deal because it knows when to activate what parts of the brain when it needs to. Like, and doesn't that feel a little bit like metacognition when you kind of like actively as a human think, let me 
put my attention on this sound or this visual or this smell? Like we're kind of making that decision process on top of the different parts of our brain that might be most activated. Google's project pathways could be a really big deal. And the fact that they're actually building this sparsely activated model really intrigues me. So now let's move from the dueling AI giants over from Google to Microsoft. I kept hearing people talk about this new AI model named after the whale, Orca. And I didn't really know what the big deal was, so I researched it, here's the TLDR. Microsoft built this much smaller than GPT-4 model and completely open sourced it. But what's interesting about the way it was trained is that it got its data not from reading the entire internet like GPT-4, but by asking GPT-4 to generate information that would make it smart without having it like kind of waste a lot of time. So Orca is what you would call a student model. It has not read the entire internet. Now people have tried this in the past, but one of the problems usually is when you have a model like this, it doesn't perform as well. It kind of sounds like it would because it can write in a similar way. But when you actually ask it some logic questions, it usually falls quite a bit flat compared to the bigger models. But the Microsoft researchers behind Orca came up with two key innovations that made it work way better. Like imagine if you come across a user manual on the internet that explains how something works. Like that was what they asked it to generate. And because of that, it ended up with a better thought process when it writes and more reasoning abilities. The second concept was called progressive learning with intermediate teaching, which is cool because the analogy is like a student with two teachers. There's two teacher models that are actually training the same student model. So the first teacher taught it to solve less complicated questions. And the second one, after it had like a good amount of intermediate knowledge, told it how to do advanced problem solving. There you have it, Orca in a nutshell. Let's talk about AI coming out of academia. Carnegie Mellon University has a new AI chatbot called Gil. Gil offers a more human-like chatting experience and it's because it understands when it should be talking with writing and when it should be generating or finding an image. And they achieved it by creating a more complex, what you call embedded space. So it took the concepts both from images and text brought them up to a higher level and treated them the same in the same latent space. So this is back this is back to the vector mathematics that we talk about a lot which is that both of them had the same semantic meaning pulled out abstracted and then used math kind of like vector math to figure out the distance between the concepts. Practically speaking what this means is that when you're interacting with the chatbot if you ask for something that seems more sensible as an image it gives you an image. If it's more sensible as text it gives you text. So a prompt like write me a children's story about a cat would know to use simple words in some cases and then images in others. You know, the answer to a question about astronomy may be better in text or maybe it needs to show you an image of like some stars or something. And if it has the image available in its vector database, it will show you that. If it needs to generate the image using stable diffusion, another open source model, it will generate it for you. Or it will just answer like a normal large language model and just type out the response. So the whole idea of adding what they call a decision module to help figure out when the right time to do what is, is just really innovative. Now let's talk about star coder, revolutionizing coding. So a new open source LLM has been unveiled. Get ready to hear more about Star Coder. So this is a combined project from Hugging Face and ServiceNow. And this model took advantage of a bunch of coding data that was recently dumped onto the internet called the stack. And it's a 6.4 terabyte data set of licensed data, but it includes a ton of code to build a training model off of, including 384 different coding languages. But supposedly these results match what GPT-4 can do. So StarCoder and its baseline version, StarCoder Base, are both made with 15.5 billion parameter models. The model shows superior performance on Python benchmarks. And now the StarCoder model is actually built into the Hugging Face Transformer library. Smash that subscribe button.